quite positive in the other Australian 20th century. Uh, what has been what has been terrible about the 20th century? Now, some of you might want to say everything. Uh, not not quite not quite correct. But uh, but just sort of you know cheer your hearts in terms of what was bad about the 20th century. So so World War One, you know, 16 million uh, people died, 37 million casualties during the war. World War Two, 60 million. Under Stalin, 20 million people were uh, eradicated. Under Mao Zedong, 45 million. Uh, you, you're familiar with the Holocaust. Uh, we're um, very aware of the incredible environmental damage that's been done during the 20th century. Uh, and also what's happened is that very clearly the collapse of, of Christianity within the world. <coughs> what was good about the 20th century? Well, it was the uh, era of the end of colonialism, which very interestingly is linked to two of the bad things that happened in the 20th century. So World War II was the catalyst in terms of the collapse of the, the Western colonial empires. So out of something really terrible, something good has happened. And, and with the collapse of colonialism, also then came the emergence of um, what we call the majority rule Christianity. Because uh, Western Christianity was no longer dominating uh, uh, people in, in the majority world. So we talk about um, end of racial discrimination, we can talk about the end of apartheid, we can talk about the collapse of um, the Berlin Wall. Some of you may want to talk about the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, uh, technological and medical progress, which has been very much a part of, um, of the 20th century. And millions of people have been lifted out of poverty in, in China and in India um, during the 20th century. Why am, I, why, why am I doing this? Um, well, it's a, it's a challenge um, for us to be a little more realistic. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's the half glass full, half glass empty, everything was bad back then. Well, everything wasn't bad back then. It was both good and bad that happened uh, during the 20th century. And the weird thing is that there's a kind of a weird dialectic that's at work there, that out of things that were really terrible, some good things have also come. Um, so that helps us to be a little bit more careful in terms of um, very quickly drawing um, nice little boxes in terms of black and white. There's a lot of grey, etc., etc., and there's a lot of dialectic that happens uh, within human experience. So, uh, Charles and Hope, um, I, have, I have always, so I was born uh, during World War II, and, um, which is not a great start. Um, my father and mother were involved in the underground uh, resistance movement. My father then was conscripted to, um, to stop um, the Dutch um, Indies, um, Indonesia, from becoming independent and then migrated to Australia. So when I was 10, I sort of met my father for the first time, which is not a great start in life either, from a, a Freudian point of view. Um, but I have, I have always been fundamentally a, a positive person, and, and I put that down to the fact that I've actually grown up in community. Both sets of grandparents live within walking distance. My aunts and uncles live within the same town. I had this amazing sense of um, being part of something that was very, very nurturing and wonderful, even though there were the dark shadows uh, uh, from the war and what happened subsequently. And I must say that, um, that there have always been older men, in particular, who have taken an interest in me, which is which is really wonderful for a young guy. Um, 
it's a bit of a crisis being a, a male uh, in, um, in our contemporary history. Um, in looking back, um, I believe that hope needs a foundation and therefore it's fundamentally different than wishful thinking or daydreaming. So in thinking about then, uh, what has been the basis, the, the fundamental basis that has sustained and nurtured and shaped um, my, my <coughs> sense of hopefulness? And I would put that down then to, to two things. Uh, one is um, despite the fact that the Bible is a messy book, And despite the fact that um, that the Bible cannot be read um, with a flat perspective, you have to read the Bible in terms of high points and low points. <coughs> um, I, I I believe that that Scripture gives me uh, a picture of um, of the redemptive healing action of God in a pretty mad and crazy world. And secondly, um, uh, if, you, if, you, if you study church history, then that is equally uh, a very, very uh, messy story. Uh, but there is much in the history of, uh, of Christianity uh, that is also uh, wonderful and incredibly exemplary. Let me, give you, let me give you just one, one very, very, no, let me give you two simple examples. In the, in the, in the, first, in the first century of, of Christianity, it was um, Christians in the major cities of the Roman Empire who went to the rubbish heaps of the cities to collect infants that had been abandoned. It was Christians. Um, <clears throat> secondly, uh, there were there were there were church leaders, for example, like like um, uh, Ambrose of um, of Milan, who. Um, who, who sold who sold all the silver and goldware uh, within the sanctuary of the church in order to buy slaves their freedom so that they could become freed men and free women. And on and on it goes. So that's been the abolition of slavery. So I'm saying a lot of bad things have happened in terms of what the church has done, but there's also been fantastically great things that the church has done. So both in terms of scripture, which is a messy book, and in terms of church history, which is equally messy, there's again um, the good and the bad, just as much as there's been in the 20th century. That's the basic point I'm trying to make. So, so it is, it is um, that, that good picture um, uh, that continues to, uh, to inspire me and, and give me hope. The, the other thing that affects my hopefulness is I believe in the absolute um, unbounded, um, crazy, unexplainable, unharnessable, undirectable uh, nature of the Holy Spirit who continues to work both in the church and in society and often works more in society in order to protect the church. Um, and that gives, me, that gives me great hope. And the fact that um, um, in terms of what's happened in our commercial world, the only, the only major church event that has not been harnessed by contemporary commercialism is uh, the day of Pentecost, uh, the coming of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. 
and that continues to give me great hope as well. Because <laughs> don't, for goodness' sake, don't let anybody <laughs> who, who has got a commercial interest <laughs> in relation to the day of Pentecost. <laughs> That'll be most unfortunate. <laughs> Um, three, three other things that, that I want to say um, that has to do with sort of my orientation towards hope. Uh, first of all, I happen to believe that, that most people are oriented towards the good. And when, when people are, are different, I believe that that has... Um, being the result of not just simply the nature of personal evil, but the misuse of the power of those who are powerful. And that then gives me hope, because, because what that means then, there's been, there's been an incredible manipulation uh, that has occurred. People have been seduced, if you like. Uh, the other thing that gives me hope is that I believe that evil constantly overplays its hand. When, when things are mediocre, grey, it's okay, they're just sort of meandering along. I see that as a very really dangerous phase of human history. Um, <clears throat> I would love things to be predominantly good, but when things are predominantly bad, I'm very hopeful that, that what will happen is, as things get worse, there is then the possibility of a, of a, a, a stronger movement in terms of protest and, uh, and reaction. And so that, that, that the new then is born within the framework of, uh, of pretty dark days. And uh, at the personal level, uh, the greatest threat to, to my sense of being hopeful um, is my own um, attempt to try to do too much. So, so if you've got a messianic complex, if you're a workaholic, <laughs> um, if you think that, that, um, that everything depends upon you, <coughs> uh, then that's a huge threat to being and remaining hopeful. Um, Oops. Oops. <laughs> I'm, not referring, I'm not referring to anybody in this room except myself. <laughs> so Dave Andrews. <laughs> okay, um, so, so then two persons uh, that are very briefly want to talk about. So, so, so Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, so, in the midst of the madness of Hitler, uh, Bonhoeffer continued to be incredibly hopeful and continued to, to act against all odds. So that then links this idea of what you hope for, you also have to invest in. So hope calls us to present action, even when everything seems to be hopeless. It's almost like, at least for goodness sake, save yourself uh, within that kind of situation by continuing to act. And then the other thing about Bonhoeffer is um, if you are hoping towards something, you need to be willing to suffer. So what happened was, as World War II was about to uh, break out, and our American friends, uh, theologians, who were very aware of Bonhoeffer <coughs> as, as, a, as a great up-and-coming uh, theologian, they, uh, they persuaded him to go to the United States of America to escape uh, what was happening. And Bonhoeffer was only in America for a few days, and um, then God spoke to him through a particular verse in one of the Psalms, which had to do with, what are you doing here? And Bonhoeffer then came to realise that if he wanted to be part of the future Germany in terms of what he was hoping for, then he had to be part of the craziness of the war in order to suffer through that 
you know, to be part of, of the emerging future. So hope involves suffering. Okay, Jacques Ellul, um, professor of sociology at the University of Bordeaux and a person who became a Christian through reading um, Marx's Communist Manifesto. So it's an interesting journey in the Gospels, <laughs> but there are many, many other people actually who've made that journey through, through communism have come to, uh, to Christianity. Um, the, most, the most important thing that, that I've learned from Jacques Ellul is that um, be willing in terms of human agency in what you hope for, which is presently impossible given the institutional realities, to get on your bike and create small alternatives. Don't become passive. Don't resign yourself. Don't become fatalistic. Get on your bloody bike <laughs> and ride in a particular direction. <clears throat> And Jacques Ellul did that at every level. So he was part of the hierarchy of the Reformed Church, was totally pissed off with what was going on there, excuse me, and started the house church. Professor at the University of Bordeaux, frustrated with what's happening academically, he creates uh, uh, basically um, an educational institution for street people, and for people who couldn't afford to go to university. Um, really concerned about what the government is doing with regard to social policy. He works with juvenile delinquents and drug addicts and so forth and so on. And on and on it goes. Small alternatives as a way of recognising the huge resistance that exists within given institutions. Therefore, don't resign yourself. Get on your bike and create a small alternative. Now, the book that Jacques Ellul wrote, Hope in Time of Abandonment, uh, in that uh, he makes um, three points with regard to the nature of hope. He says, first of all, hope involves active waiting. And what he means by active waiting is an ongoing firmness of purpose and perseverance. He says the second dimension to <coughs> being hopeful is facing reality. Absolutely. Look, look the beast in the eye. Realise what's going on. Um, don't tune out. Be aware. Read. Do a hermeneutics of your situation and context. And then thirdly, he says, um, maintain, um, maintain being a person of prayer. He says um, that that um, he believes actually that that uh, without without. Um, Prayer being sustained by hope will eventually die. Okay, that's it. Okay, so with um, maybe some questions you'd like to ask Charles for a few minutes um, um, before we move on to listen to Frank. I, the question I have is that's all very well, Frank, um, Charles, <laughs> but yeah, it is for you in the well. Philippines, Facing Duterte with your friends, yeah. how is that in practice? Okay, well, um, so, so just very quickly, um, I, I don't know uh, whether you're aware of what's happening in the Philippines, but um, um, we've got a, a mad president. So far, 22,000 uh, people have been killed, uh, extrajudicial killings uh, with regard to supposed drug addicts. Uh, people have been uh, kicked out of uh, Supreme High Court, senators have been jailed, uh, everybody who is involved in resistance movement is now called a communist, 
uh, etc etc so I continue to teach there and my friends and and, and, and my own involvement there is in terms of uh, facilitating various kinds of resistance movements um, okay so uh, the reason the reason why we continue to do that uh, is because first of all we do believe that the madness will end and here we have this famous saying from uh, Martin Luther King Jr. about the long arc of justice, but that arc does work. Uh, madness does come to an end. Sooner or later. We wish it was sooner, but it may be later. Uh, but, uh, but it does end. Slavery took a long time ending, but it did end. So, so that's, that's one dimension. Uh, the second dimension is that um, by continuing to act uh, in the face of, uh, of ongoing political and social madness, uh, um, we are in fact saving ourselves. Because not to act and to give in means that you then end up um, acquiescing in terms of what's going on and in that process you end up losing yourself. So the long arc of justice, you save yourself and, and, um, and you do believe um, historically that resistance usually comes from the margins anyway. So if you're, if you're, if you're part of the margin and, and you continue to act against <coughs> these much greater political forces and so forth and so on, um, you do have history on your side. Now, that doesn't sound very pious, but, but, uh, but there, there's some fundamental uh, dimensions to uh, Continue to act. Okay, just a few questions or comments. How do you encourage others to come with you? Uh, that's a very, very good question. So the um, the seminary is divided. Okay. The seminary where I teach, okay. <laughs> from which uh, a resistance movement has emerged, is yeah. divided. Yeah in terms of administration, faculty, yeah. students. Okay. So I have students in my class who are completely pro Duterte and students who are anti. Um, so what's the best the best way the best way to um, to to mobilize other people is is through um, Through, through expressing your your protest and your resistance in as civil and as peaceful and as dialogical way as possible. In other words, you're constantly willing to dialogue with people, right? Um, don't get on your high horse. Um, this is not. This is not to do with, 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 uh, with anger. Um, this is to do with, um, with a broken heart in terms of the brokenness that we see uh, within that particular situation. Anybody else with a question like that? Jacques Sernay. <coughs> Charles, what's Jacques Sernay? E double L U L. E double L U L. Thank you. Yes. So much. And I, I have I have actually written a, a meditational reader on, on this guy, and I have bought a couple of books if you're interested. And that's that's a commercial. <laughs> <laughs> so daily readings reflecting on the works of Jacques Rule. Yeah. Would, would you say that a hope is, is, is springs from trauma or or some sort of disappointment or? 
it, so it, it springs from a negative context, like a loss or something's missing or something's wrong. Yeah. Um, that's, so a, that's a really that's a really good question. My thoughts were all more ideological um, background, you know, either what you're saying or, or from a sense of having uh, certain ideals. Yeah. Um, so, 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 so basically what I would say is that I'm sure it could, but I want to say at the same time it need not. Uh, you can, um, well, I mean, we're all bruised a little bit in terms of life, although, I mean, <laughs> it really depends, I suppose, on what kind of extent of trauma that you're talking about. But, but I, think, I think it is possible for a person who has, um, has come from a good set of circumstances, good family upbringing, um, life, life has not been too brutal, <coughs> for a person like that to be full of hope and committed to justice in terms of seeking to work for change. But there, there again they recognise the lack and the negative that needs to be righted or something that should be addressed. That's where I'm coming from. Not mm -hmm. oh, oh, you're not talking there. about at the personal level? Well, it kind of is because you're recognising it. You're, yeah. you know, how, like Jesus said, those who hunger and thirst yeah. for righteousness. Yeah. But that's perhaps a little bit of... I, do, I can't imagine that there being hope where there's not something that's yeah. absent. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> correct. Because yeah. because the, the the basic the basic movement towards of hope, except of course you know if you if you really hate somebody and say hope you die, <laughs> um, which is which is probably more wishful thinking actually. Um, hope. Hope basically is oriented towards the good. Mm. So you are you are you are hoping for something um, that that can be in the world and is not yet. Mm. And you are um, ideologically, theologically, psychologically, philosophically, or whatever oriented in that direction, um, and then willing to walk, work towards that, and very clearly that implies that you're seeing around you an absence of what it is that you're hoping for. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, um, so Charles Taylor in his writings talks about the fact that, that, that one of the fundamental <coughs> characteristics of, of the human condition is that we are future oriented and we are oriented towards goodness and fullness. So that's what we long for. We don't see it here. <coughs> the hopeful person then works towards what's here in terms of what she or he sees down the road. So 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 hopeful has a visionary dimension to it. There's a line in the muse sorry, there's a line in a muse song which is um, it says love is our resistance, but it's not about what we think of Christian love and, and the love that is God. But it really hit me that one because that's kind of what you're talking about in a way. Um, and at the end of the day, if your resistance becomes hateful, then you're a part of the problem, isn't it? So acting in love in all sorts, whatever that means. Um, Okay, we might um, um, kind of take a break for five minutes and allow people to follow these reflections up in conversations with each other, and then we'll regroup in about five or ten minutes um, uh, for us to listen to Frank's uh, reflections on this. So uh, let's take these thoughts and translate them into conversations with the people around about us. Um, in the meantime, you can get up and move around and... Uh, and have a chat about those things and we'll regroup in another five to ten minutes. Okay? And we'll uh, continue our time together. Thank you. Hello.